नमस्ते वेलकम टू नेशनलिस्ट हब अ मीडिया आउटलेट व्हिच इज फोकस्ड ऑन ब्रिंगिंग फोकसिंग ऑन नेशनलिज्म भारत कल्चर हिस्ट्री एंड इट्स ग्लोरी फ्रेंड्स टुडे वी हैव अमंगस्ट अस अ इंडोलॉजिस्ट अ ग्रेट स्कॉलर somebody who has done his phd from banaras hindu university a close associate of sitaram goel ji and you know uh, is been uh, part of the hindu narrative for many decades here uh, he is a belgian by national and is a well known author and you all would have known him seen his videos earlier welcome to the show dr conrad elst good afternoon in this case I don't know when it will be broadcast but now it's afternoon. Thank you. Uh thank you for uh, sparing your valuable time uh, coming to our studios today. Uh Dr. Elst uh, let's start with uh, I know you have done a lot of work on Ram Janma Bhoomi related uh, movement you know uh, you have in depth knowledge about it. So I would want you to uh, briefly take us through the Hindu canvas post the ram janma bhoomi movement mm -hmm. of course sang parivar happens to be the largest uh, you know part of that but i'm sure there are other movements which are picking up how do you see the entire uh, hindu canvas post the ram janma bhoomi movement probably there are some positives some negatives if you could take it from there and uh, explain to us well i i hope you can tolerate from a historian that nevertheless i'll start a bit earlier so the um the movement for the liberation of the rama birthplace temple was started by an array of people uh not even from the bjp or the rss so it started with two congress politicians one of them was uh, the former uh, prime minister gulzari lal nanda and also by the last uh, hindu mahasabha member of parliament uh mahant uh, avaidyanath the personal guru of uh, the present chief minister yogi uh so and that was um really uh tied in with the congress line at that time you see people who now see the congress as a party of the minorities underestimate to what extent it still was a hindu party in the 1980s so rajiv gandhi clearly had in mind to give the hindus their temple and in exchange he would give some goodies to the muslim leadership to keep them humored like the banning of the rushdi book or the shabano um new law and um so he was not at all against that i think the decisive uh moment of change was the uh, issuing of this booklet by the eminent historians uh saying that of course there was no temple there and uh, which was against the consensus even the british even the local muslims had earlier accepted that of course there had been a temple there but so suddenly for mainstream politicians it became too risky to be seen on the side of the temple and so that's when the bjp really seized the uh, the issue and and kept you know supporting it for essentially 2 years till 1991 till after the elections so they won two elections with it 89 and 91 and then they dropped it like a hot potato that's the main reason why the edifice got uh, demolished namely you see the uh, the supreme court had promised a verdict before this announced gathering on 6th of december 92 they reneged on it they didn't do it and the bjp had created a big atmosphere in favor of replacing the mosque with the temple and they also didn't do it in fact they gathered in ayodhya more to show to the secularists look here you cannot control the hindu masses but we can we will make sure that the babri masjid is not touched and so the activists saw it differently they uh well they took the law into their own hands uh the support for that was minimal uh though uh one 
political patron of this movement can be mentioned. I think by now it's, uh, it's quite okay to give the name openly, namely Moro Pant Pingle, who was in the RSS leadership. I cannot speak for the other RSS leaders at the time, because to my knowledge, it would be very uncharacteristic for the RSS is one of the leaders goes against the party line that you see he would have uh, you know taken this particular line against the rss line so i think essentially it must have been supported by the rss as such but so in terms of uh, official statements i only know about moropan pingle's involvement so at any rate uh, many in the sang leadership were not aware of what was going to happen, were certainly not in favor of it. Like uh, Bajang Dal activists told me that uh, not only Advani was completely uh, on a different line as they were, even Vishwa Hindu Parishad leader um, Ashok Singhal tried to stop them. And so they told the story, I don't know if it's true, but it's their testimony, that they threatened him with pulling off his dhoti if he doesn't shut up. So at any rate, uh, whatever was needed, they ended up demolishing uh, the, the Babri Masjid. So um, then the BJP pulled its hands off of it, or actually it did that before, but then it certainly did. And um, so for a while there was nothing happening. Uh, Nara Singh Harao, the Prime Minister, uh, approached the Supreme Court. The su Supreme Court held off. So it was uh, years later that finally the Uttar Pradesh High Court took up the issue in right earnest. Now this is, was uh, about 50 years after it started, you know, the court case started. And so finally they got serious about it. So they ordered uh, full archaeological excavations uh, at the site, which was now possible because the building was gone. So there are no compunctions anymore in digging up everything. So there, very firmly, the existence of temple uh, foundations was confirmed. Many temple objects were found. Uh, not only then, but then it was really official. Also during the demolition in 92, Many had been found during the earlier peripheral excavations by Bibilal in the 70s. Then also when the, when the rebuilding of the temple started in 2020 thereabouts, uh, the, uh, the building company first made a big hole in the ground where they could start putting uh, the foundations. So they're also, the, you know, not looking for it, they nevertheless found many temple objects. So I mean, about the existence of the temple, there is really no doubt. Uh, they, the judges, also called to the witness stand the eminent historians. So except for the topmost ones, a number of them went and they fell through completely. So they, they were stammering, oh yeah, I, I'm not really an archaeologist, I don't know these things. I've never been to Ayodhya. Um, I only signed because my colleagues signed. And so the, the, the supposed <laughs> evidence against the temple turned out to be non-existent. So the eminent historians are all got exposed in the courts? Yes, and, and so I think they, um, they have something to answer for, because I think that the whole issue could have been settled far more peacefully without their intervention. At any rate, the court did the right thing, so they followed the conclusions of scholarship. And so they ruled in favor of the Hindu claim on the site. That, of course, um, confined the possible choices of the Supreme Court, which would have a hard time justifying a, a different verdict. Uh, but so what they apparently did was to postpone as much as possible. So the whole court case in total has lasted 69 years, which I think is exaggeratedly long. Uh, and so even then, you see, the court was trying to postpone the verdict. I think at that time, the Modi government made its only important intervention. 
And of course, it's not supposed to intervene in the sense that the judicial power is separate from the executive power. Um, but so it, it, you know, pressured the court a bit for finally coming down to business. And uh, so then the verdict came, which inevitably had to support essentially the Hindu claim to the site. So I think that the most important factor, and uh, you know, I, I hope I may be forgiven for pleading uh, the case of my own type of people, I think that the scholars really made the decisive difference. And so it is they who ensured that the judges really had no option except uh, to, to leave the site to the Hindus. So what happened after that? That, that was a movement, it was a successful movement, uh, could be in spite of it being violent. And of course, we don't have an RSS spokesman here, so mm -hmm. probably some of uh, the Bajrang Dal statements you spoke about, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ashok Singhalji, mm -hmm. uh, we really don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's a version that you heard, probably there are other op yeah. uh, versions to it. Be it that may, uh, be that it may, but then uh, what happened after the Ram Janmabhumi movement? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there is a peace, you know, even the Muslim community has kind of uh, reconciled yes. to it. So, how, do you, how, how are you seeing the canvas panning out from then on, especially after 2019-20? Um, you know, we have Kashi issue coming up, Mathura yeah. issue coming up. Uh, and, uh, you know, RSS again uh, is quite popular. I mean, it's, it's the largest NGO in the world. Right. It's expanding as it is. I mean, there are newer uh, offshoots which are coming, mm. right? Uh, there are new movements like Jaipur Dialogues is there, uh, Narsing Anand's uh, Swamiji is there, mm. and you have others, you know. There are so many others who have come up, right? Uh, P Gurus, as you said. So many people are coming up. So how do you see this entire canvas? How do you see the trajectory? I'm not specific to RSS, and I'm not mm. specific to anybody. Yeah. How do you see the canvas going after the Ram Janmabhoomi movement? with regard to the Hindu movements. Yes. Well, let's start with the uh, Bajrang Dal. You see, uh, insiders tell me that the BJP has very much clipped the wings of the Bajrang Dal. I can't judge that. Um, but um, apparently many in the BJP see it as a liability, uh, as attracting negative publicity to the Hindu cause, maybe. However, I do want to say in their defense, that uh, they, um, they, by demolishing the Babri Masjid, they have saved thousands of lives. You see, some people say, oh, you see, they caused a wave of riots, killing hundreds. Well, if they had not demolished it, it would have been thousands. Because the e very existence of the Babri Masjid would have been a constant incentive to the Muslim masses to keep on claiming the site. And which was a very art, uh, artificial demand because the place has no particular significance for Muslims. It's not one of their places of pilgrimage the way it is for Hindus. And so, you see, in any normal secular country, they would have left this place to whoever uses it, in this case, the Hindus. So it was a very artificial conflict that was artificially kept alive. And so one avenue was cut off definitively by the Bajrang Dal, by this demolition. And as for the violence that ensued, yes, some of it were street riots, but much of it was plain terrorism, was pre-planned by Islamic groups supported by Pakistan. So you had in Mumbai this uh, very large uh, terrorist attack, which in fact, one of the ways in which the Ayodhya co conflict has had an international dimension because it, it uh, started a new trend of uh, terrorist attacks that took the form of a number of different places in one city that were attacked at the same time. But this is what you later get in New York, in London, in Madrid and so on, uh, in Paris, in Brussels. Uh, so you see, it was very good of the Bajrang Dal that they kept it to this minimum. I mean, in, 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 in the real world, you know, you have to take the potential for violence into account. And so in that respect, it probably without realizing it, they did the right thing. Okay, now the others. Um, I mean, uh, they did the right thing in demolishing? Yes, the yes, yes, in fine. demolishing. You see, they limited the damage. Fine. Okay, now, um, what happened later? Well, um, 
you have some attempts which do not take the form of an organized you know, street movement, uh, more of judicial uh, proceedings, uh, to liberate the uh, Krishna Janma Bhumi and the Kashi Vishwanath. So there you see those actors are uh, <coughs> mostly of a well, private background, not a part of these organizations. There are a number of unexpected things happening. Like for instance about Krishna Janma Bhumi, it uh, turns out that the ownership of the site is something very bizarre, owned by a, a local uh, Muslim group of which the question is where did it arise from, who sponsored it and so on. Um, which also um, undercuts the Places of Worship Act 1991, which strictly speaking freezes all places of worship in their present status. Um, because in this case uh, it is doubtful that there legally was a status of Muslim ownership in uh, the time of independence. Uh, with uh, Kashi Vishwanath, we've mostly had the, um, the issue of the, the corridor, which of course foreign agencies have immediately interpreted as a, a subtle way of going towards the takeover of the uh, Aurangzeb Mosque, uh, which I don't think at present is the case anyway. Uh, there the attention has been uh, drawn by, let's say, an intra-Hindu conflict, which is uh, that a number of uh, house temples near the site have been demolished. You see, that, that creates or that, that draws attention to uh, a certain Hindu sensibility, which I sympathize with, namely that these... Uh, these little temples that have been put out of the way for essentially tourist purposes, that these really have a, an important religious and historical value. You see, I've been in Ayodhya recently where I saw the same phenomenon. A number of houses close to the contentious site have little temples inside them. Well, it's no more contentious now. Yeah, <laughs> but so they testify to how Hindus kept on approaching the contentious site as much as possible, even under uh, hostile domination. And so this is the same story in, in Varanasi. So they kept on approaching the Kashi Vishwanath as much as possible. So I think these temples have an important value, you know, even for tourist purposes. Like in Amsterdam, you have several uh, Catholic house churches in the time of the Protestant dominations. Uh, domination, uh, Catholicism was persecuted, was oppressed, so they had to hide their Eucharist and so they had churches inside houses. So that's a historical fact that has been documented and now these places are museums or at any rate accessible for the public. So, you see, to tell the story of uh, Varanasi, I think these, uh, these little temples had their importance, should have been preserved. But okay, that's maybe a small side issue, and at any rate, any, something for Hindus to decide. Uh, but so at any rate, you see, these are the things that have drawn attention since about the future I am not one of those who say, oh yeah, let's, let's reclaim all the Hindu temples that have been replaced with mosques or that have otherwise been demolished. Uh, I think that's not a priority. You see, in a few symbolic places like Krishna Janma Bhumi, like Kashi Vishwanath, yeah, this is the right thing to do, but I wouldn't generalize it. Why? Because uh, the, the real thing to do is to bring the Muslims back and then they will bring their places of worship back. So ultimately, uh, I think that's the right solution. Garvapasi uh, or Sudhi Karan as it used to be called. Uh, so you see, free them from their 
ideological prison house and bring them back. So uh, uh, let's continue with the same thought. Um, uh, till the time these people are not going to have a garwapsi, the Muslims or the Christians, um, how do you see the status of uh, Hindus, uh, at least in the near to midterm future? Um, you know, uh, what are the challenges they are facing and w what do you think they should be doing mm -hmm. for survival and for their, uh, you know, growth, existence? Mm -hmm. um, because once you assure that, then probably we could talk about the Muslims and Christians being taken back. Mm -hmm. So if you could walk us through uh, the yeah. challenges as you see today and the future and what should they be doing for getting these people back, mm -hmm. the Garwapsi? Yeah, well, um, Mohan Bhagwat has uh, recently said that uh, the Muslims are safe in India. He assured the Muslims that they have nothing to fear in India. Well, yeah, that's, there's nothing wrong with that statement, only it's quite superfluous. You see, Muslims have never been persecuted in India, unlike Hindus. Um, you see, in, in, in America, some minorities have really suffered like the blacks as such um, have suffered slavery. That's a very serious form of oppression. Now, whether today's politics of uh, affirmative action is the right answer to that, now that's up for discussion. But the historical fact that they were oppressed, that's really there. Now, in the case of India, some people assume that the minorities also need protection against the majority, that there is some compensation that the majority <laughs> has to give to the minorities. Now, that's ridiculous. You see, there has never been a time in Indian history when the Muslims or the Christians were oppressed. It was always an advantage uh, to be one of these minorities rather than Hindu. And so, you have very many cases in, in late medieval history where, for example, um, two Hindus have a legal uh, contention and one of them has the foresight to convert to Islam. And so in court, automatically, he uh, is supported by the judge because Muslims are never supposed to uh, be the losers vis-a-vis -vis Hindus. And uh, so, or for instance, in the British period, the British didn't practice uh, Christian uh, conversions the way the Portuguese did. But nevertheless, it was an advantage to be a Christian. You were closer to the ruling group than as a Hindu. So you see there, the, the, the history is very clear. Uh, Hindus have nothing to answer for. And therefore, it is uh, the height of absurdity that now, under the Constitution, Hindus are actually discriminated against. And so you, you have the Articles 25 to 30 of the Constitution, where I think 30 is the most explicit, uh, namely that says that the uh, Christians and Muslims can have their schools, manage their schools, decide the recruitment of students, of professors, and especially the content of the curriculum. Whereas Hindus don't have this, except maybe if they're a totally private school, unsupported. But so generally Hindu schools have to bear a heavy burden. This was worsened by the um, a Right to Education Act, Passed uh, by the Congress government. Yes, passed by the Congress government. However, if I'm well informed, you can't really blame the Congress government for the inequality because they simply decreed that schools have to take in 25% of non-paying pupils. And you know you can be in favor or not of this socialist measure, but at any rate, in principle, it counted for all schools. Then is the, the court that decided, ah, but you see, Christian and Muslim schools are exempt from this. And so that's when the inequality starts. So here you can't really blame Congress, you can blame the Constitution. 
And so that is really, I mean, you don't need a Congress Mukt Bharat, as some BJP activists say. No, <laughs> you need to change the constitution. And so that's where I think the, uh, the BJP is failing. You see, I'm ready to praise the BJP for their achievement in Vikas, in development. Also, the international stature of India has grown enormously. But in terms of uh, the communal situation inside India, there they completely fail. You see, they have a, a, a unique majority. I don't know if they'll still have it after the next elections. But so now they have an, a unique majority where they can amend the constitution if necessary. In fact, in the case of Article 30, maybe they don't even need to amend this article because when the Constituent Assembly voted on it, clearly all the Hindus there did not intend to institute a discrimination against Hindus. When they said, okay, the minorities have these rights, very probably they presupposed, well, of course the majority has these rights. And so it's under Indira that the, the interpretation changed and from then on you start having a, a very strong disadvantage of being a Hindu. And so then organizations within Hinduism who invest in education start running for the exit. Like the famous uh, court case of the Ramakrishna mission that wanted to be acknowledged as a non-Hindu minority. Uh, or more recently the uh, Vira Shaivas. So you see clearly and, and objectively verifiable there is a disadvantage on being a Hindu that some sects try to get away from. Um, so you see that's an interpretation of Article 30. Maybe that's a wrong interpretation. You see so already seven years ago the BJP could have approached the Supreme Court for an authoritative interpretation of this article. And so then maybe automatically without any parliamentary procedure uh, this discrimination would have been abolished. Uh, alternatively they can amend the constitution and it's easy to do. First of all parliamentary speaking it's you know they have the required majority or if they really need a two-thirds majority well it's a very easy issue to convince a few smaller parties of. Why? Because it's not, it's not in the name of Hindu Rastra or something militant. No, it's just equality. It's just secularism. You see, in a secular state there is no discrimination between people on the grounds of their religion. So in this case there should be no discrimination against Hindus on the ground of religion. So if you abolish this discrimination, it's not a Hindu thing to do. No, it's a secular thing to do. It's a democratic thing to do. So it should be rather easy to convince some other parties of this. And uh, so once they have achieved that, you know, they can finally, which they have now failed to do, highlight this achievement. You know, we brought you equality, which you deserve. Now here, um, after a little bit of criticism of the BJP, I would dare to voice a little criticism of the Hindus in general. Because you see, this discrimination that I have just described, well, that already exists for decades. And no Hindu has seen necessary to do something against it. You know, they, they had big uh, street parades about, you know, the ownership of one temple but about this far more fundamental, far more consequential issue, nobody cared. So I would call on them to, you know, think about it and then do something about it. Fair enough. Uh, let's see, because there are political compulsions, there are legal compulsions, what the government does, courts have been, uh, you know, turning it around. Uh, you know, we have some challenges. Le your suggestion is well taken. Probably that's the way a lot of intellectuals think about it. Uh, now let's uh, flip the scene to Europe. Um, we see churches declining there. Uh, UK has announced that uh, Christians who declare themselves as Christians are now uh, less than 50%. And then you have the right-wing movements 
like uh, Giorgio Meloni coming up, Marine Le Pen, uh, you know, doing well. Yes. And then uh, you have demographic change happening there. Mm -hmm. The Muslims of North Africa and, uh, uh, you know, Asia um, flooding your countries yeah. and your, uh, you know, streets. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have uh, the woke culture which is taking over, especially from America and Europe also, yeah. you see that. So these kinds of changes uh, that are happening in Europe, how do you see uh, Europe surviving or you mm -hmm. know, what's going to happen to Europe? Yeah. And what are the lessons we in Bharat should learn mm -hmm. so that we insulate or protect ourselves yeah. from similar challenges that may spill over? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the, the woke phenomenon uh, only sharpens a tendency that already existed. All the sort of left-wing governments uh, strongly uh, shielded Islam from criticism. Uh, I've seen the change happening in about the mid-90s. So until then, uh, leftist intellectuals were typically anti-church and they automatically uh, transferred this to the issue of Islam. So when Salman Rushdie was persecuted in 1989, most leftist intellectuals were on his side and against the Ayatollahs. But today, if the same thing were to happen, I'm afraid that it would be the reverse. And so, so you see this in other issues, like for instance about the hijab. Uh, I see in Belgium there is one Iranian member of our parliament who strongly supports this opposition of Iranian women. Well, you see, most of our official feminists and so on don't want to have anything to do with it or find excuses for Islam. Um, so uh, that tendency was already there for at least 25 years. Um, and w which has to do with what you also described, the rise of right-wing movements. You see, right-wingers used to be rather pro-Islamic, uh, often nastily because of the anti-Jewish angle. And so those were people who were still no nostalgic of the Nazi era and so on. Those people have died out. And anyway, they discovered, you see, that the people on the street had no problem particularly with the Jewish community, but had more and more problems with the Muslims. So they changed tack. And because of that, the leftists, who were more against them than against, well, whatever position vis-a-vis -vis Islam, then decided to side with Islam. And um, so that, that tendency has grown stronger and stronger. Um, like you, you had the case of Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who, you know, who put on a hijab and so on. So th this tendency is quite, quite, quite strong. Uh, a seeming exception is France, where President Macron uh, supported a number of the victims of uh, Islamic terrorism, the you know, teacher and the, the press men who had supposedly offended Islam. But on the whole, you see, he's not fundamentally changing the situation. And um, so that's where you have the, the rise of right-wing parties. In the case of Italy, they actually took power. In the case of Sweden, they are supporting the government from the opposition, but so the government more or less toes their line. In other countries, you see, and this is a, a, a development I find really healthy, that other parties are taking over this uh, Islam critical line. Like in Austria, the Socialist Party uh, that has always patronized policies that ultimately benefited Islam, now is taking you know, the, the feedback from its own voters that now we really have to do something about this. Um, so I hope that that is the future, that more and more uh, parties are going to take this issue in to heart. Though at the same time, I think it's, it's pretty late in the day to do so. Um, so, you see, to some extent, the growth of Islam is assured, partly by immigration, partly by higher birth figures. They're not dramatically high, but always higher than the corresponding non-Muslim groups. Same in India. And um, 
inevitably, probably earlier in Europe than in India, but in both places, in let's call it the western subcontinent of the Eurasian landmass and the southern subcontinent, in both of them by end of the century you will have a Muslim majority. Only I'm not so sure of that because at the same time inside the Muslim world you have a tendency towards apostasy. The same thing that I saw in Catholic Flanders, the northern part of Belgium, that I've personally lived through. So when I, at 15, decided to stop with Catholicism, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was part of a very large movement that has almost destroyed the presence of the Catholic Church in my country. And so I see the same thing starting to happen in the Muslim world, uh, in Muslim communities in Europe, but also in the Arab world, in the Middle East, like you've had a few uh, polls every 10 years by the, this American uh, Religious Science Institute, uh, Pew uh, Research, and so they notice a systematic decline in adherence to Islam. Now, and there of course they have to be careful with how public they go with it. Uh, in Europe it is more open. As for India, here, of course, they have a lot of freedom. Even the, the, one of the Sunni leaders has just a few days ago said so, that, you know, all this B BBC documentary blaming Modi and so on is totally untrue to the reality of India, where Muslims have all the freedom they want, more than in Pakistan. So that, that's one side of it. On the other, you also have the polarization between Muslims and non-Muslims, which is far more stronger here than in Arabia. And therefore, many people also are reluctant to break with their community because they feel it's a betrayal. And so this, mm, there are factors you know, working against it in India. But on the whole, I think the, this movement is going to affect India just as much. So I am not too sure that uh, Islam will become the majority here, no. Great. Um, now let's look at uh, our near neighborhood. Uh, Pakistan is uh, financially broke already. Mm -hmm. uh, societally it is broke. Yeah. Uh, there is Balochi movement, there is Sindh movement, Khaibar Pakhtunkhwa. You have all kinds of movements that are yeah. springing up there. And then there is the angle of uh, their snakes coming to bite them, yeah. TTP and others. Yeah. So, strangely, the border with us is the most peaceful for them. Yeah. The other two borders are very active for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so is China. China was having all the time to needle us. Yeah. But now they are quite busy internally with their own uh, economic situation, yeah. their own health situation. Yes. So, these two of course are the biggest. And then we have a failed uh, Sri Lanka, almost failing Nepal and Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been doing well, but then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they are also a little shaky right now. And then Maldives, you know, all the entire neighborhood seems to be quite in turmoil. Myanmar, we know what's happened to it. So we seem to be the only, uh, you know, positive thing in the entire neighborhood. How do you see the, this canvas panning out in the days to come, in the maybe years to come? Do you see the balkanization of Pakistan or even China? Because a lot of people keep talking about it. Maybe Xinjiang will break away. Maybe Tibet will break away. We don't know. I don't know. Uh, these are all talk people say. Once CCP collapses, probably this yeah. will happen. That's a narrative. How do you see as a historian? Historically, what are the reasons for nations to break up? Uh, do you see those signs in Pakistan and uh, in China or maybe even in Myanmar or whatever? Uh, or probably even in Bharat. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Christians probably start demanding a separate country for Christians at some point in time. Mm -hmm. So how do you see this entire uh, Indian subcontinent, if you want to call that. I don't want to use the term South Asia. Mm -hmm. How do you see these things happening? Do you see balkanization in the coming 20, 30, 40 years? Or do you think uh, we will be a glue for all these people to start uh, being nice to us? Well, let me say first of all that I uh, count myself very lucky that I am visiting India exactly at this time. Because right now India is shining. Is, is really doing very well compared to all the others. Not only its neighbors, also the other superpowers, each in their own way, China, Russia, and America are in trouble. 
And so India is doing very well comparatively. Economically, it has the highest growth of all the uh, major economies. You know, development, y you can't miss it, it's everywhere. Um, the on the communal front, it's relatively peaceful. I hear that uh, here in Hyderabad, they have just nabbed some terrorists who were planning mischief. Uh, this is also one merit of the BJP government, that they give a free hand to their police, that they do not corruptly uh, stay their hand whenever they're about to strike. Um, so it's a good thing that terrorism has sense, uh, palpably declined in India. On the whole, I mean, there's, there's nothing but good news about India. And uh, as for the neighbors, well, <laughs> there the picture is not so good, especially Pakistan. So Pakistan balkanized. Uh, it, it still has a strong united army. It's not like the army of Afghanistan that immediately gave up once the Americans weren't there anymore. So I wouldn't uh, hazard uh, a too negative guess. But yeah, it is true that they are facing a lot of trouble. However, uh, if you look at India, they also had to deal with separatist movements and India is still there. So I wouldn't be that pessimistic about Pakistan. But then in, in all other respects, it is a failing state. And, uh, it, you know, parts of it have also become a colony of China, uh, which, you know, I don't know, they, they're suffering negative consequences, but it's nothing glorious at any rate. It's nothing that will happen to India. Um, as for China, as far as I can see, the nationalism of the Chinese people is such that I wouldn't fear any breakaway there. Like uh, in Xinjiang, a very large part of the population is now ethnically Chinese. They certainly don't want to uh, have the, the region break away. In Tibet too, uh, you know, those who really go for Tibetan independence are mostly outside Tibet. And uh, again, the Chinese have changed the demography there. So I don't think chances are high that they will break away. As for, uh, yeah, well, Russia, of course, is in big crisis. That may really, that may really get balkanized if, if the war turns out negatively. Uh, the United States, of course, at the moment is in thrall to a great division because of this woke uh, movement. You see, when Biden won the elections, the press said, oh, oh, oh yes, uh, now he can start rebuilding and reuniting the divided American people. And his first speech was exactly the opposite. Uh, was very aggressive against all those who hadn't voted for him. And, and so this is the, the, the state of uh, affairs in America at the moment. So I suppose economically and so it's surviving quite well. But you see the internal core of America is, is very much threatened. So comparatively, India is doing quite well. These separatist movements that used to exist are not what they used to be. Like, I don't know if anyone remembers, but the Dravidianist movement before 1962 used to be openly separatist. And so they saw it didn't work because during the Chinese invasion, they noticed that their own rank and file strongly supported India against the invaders. So that, that was no longer a realistic option. However, uh, we do see a revival of the Khalistani movement, strongly supported internationally. Um, and, and so in places like the Northeast, the, the relative quiet that exists at the moment, well, you know, it can always come back. The, uh, the basis of the separatism is still there, namely the Christianization, the fact that Christians still feel like like uh, foreigners in India. Uh, so in, in Christian circles, and I, I know these a little bit better than, for instance, the inside of the Indian Muslim community, I have no access to. But you see among Christians, the idea is that, well, they don't really care for a state of their own the way Muslims do, because, or did at the time of the partition, uh, because in Islam you have the notion of an Islamic law, 
which a state has to enforce. That's not there in Christianity. When Christianity started, it was a little nervous minority in this big Roman Empire, and the only thing they could do was to accept the law of the land. And so there is an element of secularism within Christianity, which is not there at all in Islam. And so in India, they have all the freedom to practice and even to propagate. So there is no reason for them to spend their energy on some rebellion against the Indian state. And so you see, they, I mean, like for instance, the, the fact that Vande Mataram or even Janakana Mana can be construed as idolatrous is no point for Christians. Muslims may object to that, but for Christians it's okay. Uh, so in India they flourish quite well. Uh, they are growing spectacularly. Uh, and you don't see it by the census figures because now they instruct their new converts to just keep on calling themselves Hindu whenever it's useful. Uh, so I don't expect the further strengthening of Christianity in the Northeast to uh, revive a separatist movement there. But, you know, again, there are many local factors that I don't know of, uh, so I wouldn't exclude it. But at the moment, you see, the best thing for Indian unity is Indian success. If people can be proud of India, they are much less likely to want to separate from it. The same thing counts for Hinduism, which, to be clear, I do not consider as a synonym of India. So, if you can be proud of Hinduism, you know, you're not going to say, hum Hindu nahi. No, no, you're going to say, we are Hindus. And in fact, we are the best Hindus. So, you see, that's what I see the next, the next Bhindran Wale or so say, you know, he convert out of separatism. And, and join Hinduism and be proud, you see, like, just like Govind Singh said, uh, you know, the, the Khalsa is there for the defense of Vedic Dharma, you know. So, uh, the, the, the Vira Shaivas and so on, the Ramakrishna mission is really going to repeat what Vivekananda said, Garav uh, Sega Ho Ham Hindu, huh? So, you know, if you get to know the real history of Hindu Dharma, there's lots of reasons to be proud of it. You know, the, the, of course, the, 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 the yogic component, but equally the scientific component that you see Hindus know far too little about. And so the, uh, let's say, the adversary loves to play up any Hindus that, that take an obscurantist line, uh, who are, you know, withering, declining minority, but they still exist. And, and so pull the attention away from the real merits of Hindu Dharma. And so, you see, once this gets better known, and here you see, of course, my own pet concern about uh, reorienting history teaching uh, comes into play. But so when people become more aware of the true history of Hindu Dharma, they will favor it a lot more. Well, Garu Se Kaho Ham Hindu Hai, I think that sums up uh, most of, uh, you know, the positivity that you said. One last question, Professor. Uh, uh, you know, how do you, what, what are the aspects of our civilization or our Sanatana Dharma as you, as somebody who came from outside, read it, see, uh, which is going to help the world survive, sustain a civilization or the mankind? As we see, there is decline economically, there is decline uh, socially, there are so many declines that are happening. Mm -hmm. You know, long term basis, maybe 50 years from now, 100 years from now. What are the aspects of Bharatiya civilization and Sanatana Dharma that would help the whole global world attain, uh, you know, uh, human uh, balance and uh, peace? Well, <laughs> one um, merit of uh, Hindu civilization that was in the news only a few years ago is unfortunately not going the right way. Namely, uh, here more and more people whom I meet want to shake hands with me. Now, one of the nice things <laughs> in India is that you would not shake hands. And uh, so when the corona thing broke out, you know, Westerners, including the then President Trump, 
have immediately praised India for having an alternative for these handshakes. So I, I think in that regard, Hindus had better go back to their roots. Um, so yeah, I mean, there may be more elements that, um, that deserve to be promoted, like for instance, the, the whole ecology wave certainly favors the um, Indian tradition of vegetarianism, admittedly not the tradition of all Indians, but okay. Uh, certainly something uh, based in, in particular strands within Hindu Dharma. Um, otherwise, well, uh, here you have to think uh, profoundly about to what extent Hindu culture is peaceful. I mean, traditionally you also had warriors like um, I was recently in, in Mangalore where I learned a bit more about this queen uh, Abaka and it turns out that she was a giant. I didn't know that. So you see even the proverbially non-violent giants could be very effective in waging war. Okay, so I wouldn't reduce Hinduism to that. Nevertheless, there is something to it. You see there is a, a very non-violent element in Hinduism at a more fundamental level uh, when communities wanted to integrate into Hinduism uh, the way for instance uh, Dr. Ambedkar describes how tribes became castes, you know, self-contained societies became part of a larger society, tribes became castes. And so the approach of Hindu society was to respect their identity. And so they had their own type of clothes, their own type of music, their own cuisine and so on. Nobody interfered with this. Uh, even for communities coming from outside, like the Parsis or the Syrian Christians, they effectively became what in India is, or what foreigners coming to India call a caste. Or another example is the Jats. You see, they came from uh, Iran, or from the Iranian world. Um, uh, so you have the Getai in, in the Greek version of history. Now, Get, that root, translates into Sanskrit as Jat. And so they retain their communal identity. I mean, they remain a community, but they assimilated in language, in religion, and so on. But so, you see, this was the Hindu approach. And uh, in, in that sense, you see, that is an example for the rest of the world an example of how to integrate, how to live with differences and yet be united. Wonderful. I think uh, Hindus should go back to their roots and uh, how do you assimilate, uh, you know, uh, divergent uh, mm -hmm. uh, aspects into a common goal. Wonderful message, uh, Dr. Conrad Elst. Uh, thank you so much for sparing your time and talking to us. And I'm sure we will have occasions to uh, speak to you about other historical aspects, probably about uh, Rig Vedic issues and you know uh, timing issues. Yeah. Probably some other day we will catch up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This, friends, is the uh, wonderful talk that we heard from Dr. Conrad Elst in uh, you know trying to uh, give his perspective about what happened during the Ram Janmabhoomi movement. Post that, how how does he see the canvas? and uh, the overall uh, culture that's uh, overall issues that are happening across the globe and how is Bharat's civilizational values that are going to fit or going to guide the world in the coming days. Thank you so much for uh, supporting us and uh, please like, share and subscribe to Nationalist Hub and spread this word of positivity that Dr. Elst has espoused in his talk today. Um, you know, some of you may agree or may not agree with some of his views, but then he's a scholar. So he is presenting what as a scholar he uh, has seen it. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of takeaways from this. So uh, thank you so much for supporting all of us and keep, please keep watching Nationalist Hub, a uh, news revolution. Thank you.